Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and good morning. We would like to welcome you to worship this morning on the fourth Sunday of Advent. If you are visiting with us this morning, we extend to you a special welcome. And if you would like to share some information about yourself and leave it with us, you can do so by filling out the pew pad that is at one end of your row or the other. Um, we would love to have some information about you. Um, also, we would invite you to the second service social following the service where you can mix and mingle and we can learn a little more about you that way as well. We would also like to invite everyone to our Christmas Eve service, which will be on Tuesday at 7.30 here in the sanctuary. This is a great opportunity to invite those relatives or neighbors who might be looking for a place to worship at this special time of year. We'll have lumin Our luminaries will be set up outside in the courtyard beginning at 7 on that evening as well. If you would still like to place a name on a luminary bag, they are still available outside the fellowship hall, and we invite you to do that. Um, the office will be closed over the next week and a half or so, two weeks. If you would like more information about that, you can see it in the newsletter or talk to Jamie, Andy, or myself. And it's complicated. We might be able to help you. We will try our best. Um, also, next Sunday, we will be having one service at 10 a.m. It will be a lessons and carols service. We invite you to come to that. Because it is one service, we also do not have Sunday school. And that, again, is next Sunday. We invite you to join us. And last of all, thanks to all who um, purchased poinsettias in honor or memory of someone. They are beautiful and decorate our fellowship hall. Um, you are free to take those if one has been given to you or you have purchased one, but not until the end of the Christmas Eve service. So we invite you to take those following that. I do not believe there are any other announcements. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
The Lord be with you. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to all of God's people. Let us pray. Almighty God, wherever you go, wherever you come, hope is reborn. Set us free from whatever keeps us from trusting your good news in Jesus and stir our hearts to praise you and our wills to love you. For you are kind and faithful, a great promise keeper, the one who refuses to leave us alone. In the name of Christ and in the power of the Spirit we pray. Amen. Since Christ has come and opened the door to God's grace, we are free to be grace to each other. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. I will lead the blind by a road they do not know. By the paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I will not forsake them. The Lord says to his servant, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may now reach to the end of the earth. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your let us pray. Eternal God, help us not to be afraid in the dark, but to trust that your light will lead the way through the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. I'd like to invite all children forward at this time. <laughs> uh oh. Come on up. You can sit here. Good morning. Well, it's great to see everyone this morning, and it looks like, can anybody tell me how many candles in our wreath have been lit? Four candles are lit, so what does that mean? Does anybody know what that means? Four weeks of Advent. That's right, we have observed this is our fourth week of Advent, and this is our season of prayer and preparation, and last week we talked about we're adding joy into this that as we're preparing we are reminded that it's a time of joy also well so i'm wondering is anyone ready for christmas maybe okay everyone's ready does that mean has anyone made a christmas list of things that you would like to get on christmas morning you have you haven't yet well, your time is running head. out, just my to head. let you know. <laughs> well, I want to tell you an ancient story of Christmases long, long ago when old people like me were your age. We used to get these big books, we called them catalogs, and they were from the stores, and we would flip through the pages and we would say, oh my goodness, I would love if I could have that for Christmas. Do y'all still do that? You still do that? Oh, thank God. <laughs> so I'm not as old as I thought. But we used to make a list of all the things that we would like to have for Christmas. And so some of you said you made a list of the things you would like to have for Christmas. And I started wondering, what if God was to make a list of the things God wants for Christmas? What do you think would be on that list? Peace, love, and joy for everyone. Peace, love, and joy for everyone. I think that would be Peace good. Peace on earth. That'd be a great thing. Other ideas? If we stumble. Flowers. Oh, yes. I think God loves flowers. Praise. Praise. These are great things. I think those are all things that we would find. Love, 
we would find those things on God's list of the things God wants for Christmas, I think maybe right at the very top of that list is that God wants to be with you. Did you know that's what God wants for Christmas? God wants to be with you. And really, that's what Christmas is all about. Because when God sent God's Son, Jesus, it was all about God wanting to be with you. That's what it's all about. God said, I want to be with you so much, I'm going to become a baby and live in your world and walk and learn the things that you do and do the things that that maybe are hard for you. I want to experience those things as a person too. And so this week, on Wednesday, we're going to celebrate Christmas. I wonder if on Christmas Day, if we could take some time and say, I want to give God what God wants the most and give God some time on Christmas Day. Could we do that? I think we could. Let's hold hands and say a prayer. Dear Dear God, we are so excited about Christmas. And there are a lot of things that we want. But help us to pause. That help us to pause and, think about and think about the things that you want. The things that you want. Help us to spend time with you. On Christmas Day. And every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Our scripture reading today is from Luke's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 5 through 25, and then verses 57 through 66. There wasn't just one surprise baby at Christmas, there were two, and we hear about the first one coming into the world, John the Baptizer. Before we read from God's Word, let us pray together. God of angels and archangels, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our fear and enter in. Be born anew in us today. As we hear the story of your coming, make us new through Christ our Lord, lying in a manger. Amen. Luke 1, verse 5. Hear the gospel of our Lord. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, Zechariah was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the days these things occur. Uh, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. Now verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he's to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives has this name. Then they began motioning to the father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors and all these things were talked about throughout the entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered them and said, What then will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord was with him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Mm. 
I heard a story recently about a woman from India who gave birth to twins. She was 73 years old. Uh, She had no children prior to these twins. She was able to become pregnant because of modern medical technology, which for me raises an intriguing question. Why on earth, uh, who on earth, excuse me, would want to have children on purpose, twins no less, at age 73? Uh, Believe it or not, I have an answer to that question. Someone for whom not having children is a lifelong disgrace. Someone who lives in a culture where the social stigma about not being able to have children is very strong and someone who suffered that stigma for a long time Someone for whom bearing a child would bring legitimation, liberation, relief. Someone like Elizabeth, whose very faithful life had this cloud of barrenness hanging over it. Uh, Zechariah lived under that cloud with his wife Elizabeth. Both of them were devoted to Israel's commandments and the God who stood behind them. But their faithfulness had not paid off as they might have expected. I guess they wondered if they'd done something wrong. Were we just unlucky? They didn't have answers to that question. But as they got older, I suppose they'd learned to live with those unanswered questions. Uh, The elderly couple did not give up on God exactly. They kept worshiping and serving God as faithful people do. But resignation had crept in. Reality had knocked their hope down a notch or two. No matter how much they prayed and sacrificed, no baby was coming. The older you are, the more you get used to such disappointments. Am I right? We know that the couple was resigned to their barrenness because of Zechariah's response to the angel Gabriel. Uh, Zechariah, a priest for the people of Israel, was taking his turn at the altar of incense in the ancient temple of Jerusalem, which, unlike our altar table, was secluded. Gabriel met met him there all alone with the news that Elizabeth, without the help of modern technology, was about to conceive and give birth to John, the forerunner of the Messiah. Naturally, Zechariah wondered how this could be. He and his wife weren't exactly spring chickens. Children at their age? And that's exactly what Zechariah said to the angel Gabriel. How can this be? The older we get, the harder it is to believe that something new can be born. What often appears to be new, we've learned from our experience, is actually something older taking its turn again. Skinny jeans and thin lapels, those aren't new, are they? New programs to help the poor, when you take the lid off of them, have a lot of the same nuts and bolts of previous programs. Shake the husk off a lot of churches and the kernels that are left look a whole lot like the gospel that's been preached for eons. It's enough to make us think that the old preacher in Ecclesiastes was on to something when he said, there's really nothing new under the sun. Same old, same old. We are more likely to come to these conclusions the older we get. And they guard us. They guard us from being taken. They guard us from being suckers again. Well, if if we share Zechariah's skepticism about a baby coming to his ancient wife, we might want to keep it on the lowdown, keep our voices quiet, because Gabriel, as you know, is flying above our steeple this morning, and he may be listening in. Gabriel did not give old Zechariah much slack when it came to his resignation about the way things are. Because Zechariah was slow to believe the promise of a coming baby and the beginning of a new world, 
Gabriel took away the voice of this priest. The one who had said so many prayers on behalf of the people was now speechless. A few verses beyond our story today, Gabriel will visit Mary, the mother of Jesus. She too will balk at the possibility of having a child. But Gabriel will not be harsh with her. The way Gabriel sees it, younger folks can be expected to be more skeptical about God's radical new life promises. But not older folks. Not those who have lived for decades and know from experience how God has been faithful through every storm and every tragedy and every disappointment. Uh, Listen, don't tell Gabriel that you've lived a while and you're all wised up now and it's perfectly understandable for you to be guarded about the good news of God and the possibility of something truly new happening. Oh, when Gabriel hears old folks talk like that, he zips our lips. Now, I've always felt sorry for Zechariah, probably because I identify with him. So what I'm about to tell you, I am still learning to accept. It is a good thing for Zechariah to lose his voice. It is a good thing When the angels aren't little chubby cherubs sitting on the mantle, but come with some fire in their eyes. It's a good thing when Gabriel swoops down to put a cork in our skepticism, self-pity, convenient cynicism, and hard-won hopelessness. We are so full of despair parading as wisdom that Gabriel has to do something to make room for the gospel. Do you see why the angel did what he did? To clear out some space in Zechariah. To quiet his hopelessness down. To make room for the possibility of joy. Last week we talked about making room for sorrow, and I still believe we can and should during the holidays. Secret longing, grief, and sadness are just a part of this season for some of us. If you have a a loss that you need to mourn, well, please mourn that loss. But Advent also brings joy. Joy that knows how to live alongside of sorrow. That's kind of the whole point. Hope in despair. Light when it gets dark. A new baby and a new beginning when we have no right to expect one. This season wants to give us the kind of hope in God that leads to joy. And not in some far off distant future, but right now. Why wouldn't we want to make room for that? Well, there are reasons. I know someone, not from here, far away, who after all these years would just rather be bitter. She's had some tough things happen to her, really tough things, crippling things. And as a means of coping, she's turned hard. Hardness helped her to survive. It helped her get through college and knock down walls that had to be knocked down if she was going to achieve. But she doesn't really need that hardness anymore. She's proven herself. Unfortunately, all that negative energy that motivated her is still there, and it's got her trapped. So she says, don't talk to her about hope, possibilities, and God being on her side, not after she's had to claw and scratch to get everything she's got and keep her head above water. She is so attached to her pain that she doesn't know how to let go of it. And so there's almost no room for joy. I know another someone, again a person you don't know, who needs more certainty about stuff than he's ever going to get. 
He's smart, a student of history, likable. But when he looks at the evidence across time, he cannot get past the bloodiness, the carnage, the constant factor of humanity always acting humane against, inhumane against itself. The world's a mess, he thinks. And either God is good and not powerful, or God is all-powerful but not good. So don't talk to him about a purpose overarching history, some goal that we're supposed to be headed to, a new day that God will bring someday and, and is already here if you just have the eyes to see the signs. Don't tell him that. He just can't buy the hope that Advent is selling. And you know what I've noticed? There's just really not much joy in his life. I know some people, and I know me. Part of the reason I can identify the hardness and doubt in other folks is because I see it in myself. I've gotten used to these things, along with self-protection. You see, hope makes us vulnerable. What if we put our trust in a promise and then that promise doesn't come true? After our hearts break a few times, we learn to be cautious. We often choose safety over the possibility that God might come to birth among us. The problem is we're comfortable. We've actually learned how to live with things like bitterness and doubt and despair and it's hard to let go of what we're used to so I am glad Gabriel won't be denied and still comes to blast good news into our ears from the highest heaven may he overwhelm our never ending dirges this season and make room for joy I don't need phony Christmas cheer any more than you do. But all of us could use the glad tidings that God has come in Christ, that God continues to come to us in the Spirit, and God won't stop coming until all things, including you and me, are made new. Uh, one of my favorite stories of this season is how the Grinch stole Christmas. I like it because it's a conversion story. And you know, Christian preachers, we like conversion stories. Uh, do you remember who's converted in the story? That's right. Everybody. Not just the Grinch. The Grinch knows the truth about the who's in Whoville. That their buying and getting and feasting is a cover-up. The Grinch believes if he takes off the covers... There will be nothing there, just a barren wasteland. To prove his point, he steals all the Christmas stuff in Whoville down to the very last roast beast, knowing that when the town awakens on Christmas morning, they will do nothing but grieve their loss. So he is utterly surprised when Christmas dawns and and rising from Whoville are songs of celebration as they welcome Christmas morning. That's when the Grinch's heart goes from very little to very large, from very cold to warm, and he believes again in something bigger and better than himself. But the Who's in Whoville are converted too. They too have lost faith in Christmas. And therefore they smother it with activity and things that glitter that are not gold. Grinch actually does them a favor by taking all the stuff away. Then they discover, as he does, that beneath all their frantic activity, a light shines without all the attachments they thought they needed. Whoville and Greenville it's not barren after all. New life can be born. Do you remember who sings at the end of the story? 
That's right, everybody. Joy. Zechariah finally got his voice back after nine months. That's a long, silent retreat. He had a lot of time to think. We can only guess at his thoughts. But we do know his wife showed signs of what was coming. And he pondered the angel's message. In the midst of all that, something must have clicked. He had a conversion. Out of this skeptical, cautious, hard-shell self-protection into a land where anything is possible with God. We know he was converted because once his vocal cords loosened up, he didn't ask any of those questions he had been asking. What did he do? He praised God. And there was happiness all in the hill country of Judea. Great, great joy. I don't know what it might take for you and me to be converted, but I pray it happens. I need conversion almost every Christmas to put down my resignation and trust in God's possibilities, to believe once again in something bigger and better than myself, to believe in something new under the sun that's as old as God's love. What do you need to put down in order to make room for joy? people of God, let us affirm our faith together. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ is our hope and salvation. All the promises of God find their fulfillment in Him. He is the Messiah, the one anointed with God's Spirit, who came to live with us so that we might live with God. Therefore, we call Him by many names, Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Eternal Savior, Prince of Peace, as members of his kingdom, we eagerly await and work for the day when all things in 
prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. Your prayers are powerful and effective. Please remember these persons throughout the week. Wanda Jones, who's now in Knoxville, recuperating and recovering near her daughter Katie, along with her husband Klein. Doug Duff, who continues his treatments through the holiday season. Eloise Emery, whom we're happy to report has been able to return home and is continuing to recover there. Also, those who are grieving among us, the family of Don Forche, and we would add to that list the family of Richard Walker. Richard was the brother of Albert Walker. Albert and his wife, Albert, have been members of the church for a year. Albert died a few years ago, so please remember that family. We're adding new to our list, Joanne Cook, who looks like she may have to have some sort of treatment or surgery after the new year begins, and Vicki Andrew, who had a heart attack late last week, has had a procedure in Johnson City, will return home, we hope, in the next couple of days. God listens, so let us pray. God of mercy, as the day quickly approaches, we take delight in your great gift, Jesus Christ, and thank you for all the hidden treasures in this season for time and love shared with those dear to us, for the promise that daylight is getting longer and night is getting shorter, for a break in routines and schedules, for all the resources and people that make travel safe and possible, for the chance to remember all that we have and to give generously in light of your gift. Keep us awake and alert, for all signs of your presence as we celebrate the coming of your Son. Because you have shown your love for this troubled world, we also share some of our concerns with you. Please hear us as we lift up to you those who are cold this winter and those who are trying to help them. Babies that are born addicted. The elderly without family to support them. Children who receive too little this Christmas and children who re will receive too much. Soldiers, servants, and others who are working and won't be able to share the holiday with families. Our elected officials in the White House and in Congress as they work through conflict. And those who need good news, but haven't heard it yet. Though this day is moving towards its end, keep us open to you today and throughout the week so that we will continue to commune with you for strength and direction through Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen. Leslie Krutzinger has some words to share with us about our giving to high school students. Good morning. <sighs> Although I talk to high school kids all day, you people make me nervous. <laughs> Whew. Okay, my heart's beating. Um, I wanted to take this time to give you a report about how your generous gifts were used at the high school this year. I will try to make it through without crying, which is why I typed this out and prepared what I wanted to say, but you know me, so we'll see. Um, as you know, Monty's Christmas, as it's called the high school, it's named after our mascot, is very near and dear to mine and Lena's hearts. And this church has embraced that and made it your mission as well. Your donations totaled an estimated $3,000 which is truly unbelievable. We were able to adopt five students. With your donations, each student received the following necessities. At least two pairs of shoes, several pairs of pants, several shirts, a warm winter coat, socks, underwear, toiletries, and at least one want, such as a video game, body wash, or something like that, or a gift card. Um, in addition, each student received some green devil gear from the Devil's Den store at GHS. They also each were given gift cards to McDonald's 
because they can walk there after school for a snack or a meal, as well as a gift card with enough money on it, not only to watch a movie with their friends at the local movie theater, but also to order a popcorn and a drink. However, your donations kept pouring in. So we were also able to pass out an estimated $800 worth of Food City gift cards, not only to our students' family that our church adopted, but to other families as well who were adopted by other churches or other people we just went through and we saw the kids that we thought had the most need or several siblings and started giving Food City gift cards to those bags. Your generosity was far-reaching and heartwarming. To truly understand, I will end with a story. Oh, I thought I was going to do it. God, all right. Anyway, from the day that the families picked up their gifts, you should have seen, like, when we would bring those gifts out, their eyes, just the joy um, as their gifts were carried out to them. So I helped to bring out gifts to one of my current students and the brother who's in Lena's class. And we couldn't carry all the gifts between the two of us and maybe a third person with, in, in one trip. And so they were looking at me and I said, oh, you stay right there, I'll be right back, because there's more. And my student turned to Lena's and said, did she just say there's more? And you all gave him that. You gave him this special Christmas, and you did that for many more than just our five adopted students and their families. Lena and I are truly grateful, and a special thank you to Becky Booker and Lena, who wrapped all the gifts in the entire hall. And Jesus' love was spread to families through the Greenville Cumberland Presbyterian Church, so it has also made my Christmas Lena's, and we thank you very much. What shall I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would give a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would play my part. What I have, I give him. I give him my heart. As we make our offering this morning, let us give our hearts to God.
Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your great gift in Jesus Christ, which is our life and our salvation. And we thank you for the presence that he still has with us through the Spirit, which brings us together and makes us one body and empowers us with your love to do your mission in the world. And we're grateful for that promise always calling us forward toward that new day that you are creating, the day you promise to make come when all things acknowledge your reign and live in peace, love, and justice. And we thank you for the privilege of serving with you in our own way, using our gifts, so that your word of salvation can be spread. Help us to give our whole selves to you. And thank you for the privilege of offering these gifts in your name. Through Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just as Christ is born, may joy be born in your hearts. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.